Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and also your host here on Last Week in the Church. This, of course, is the show where we take some leftover headlines out of the journalistic refrigerator, throw them into a skillet, put in some secret Crux brand sauce, and serve them up piping hot and delicious. Here's what's on the menu for this week. First, the Russians, both literally and metaphorically, block roads to the Vatican. We'll explain what's going on there. Second, this has been a great week for the Vatican conspiracy theory industry. First, we will outline sort of what that industry consists of. And secondly, we'll look at two of the great sort of mystery stories around the Vatican that have gotten a new lease on life in the past week. One, the 1983 disappearance of a 15-year-old girl whose family lived inside the Vatican named Emanuela Orlandi. Kind of old protagonist in that saga has sort of gotten back into the act in the past week. And then also, in terms of Vatican financial scandals, another familiar face is back in the fray this week. We will unpack all of that and more. Speaking of unresolved Vatican mysteries, the Vatican was also apparently the object of a hack during this past week. Still unclear who did it or what the agenda was. We'll try to break down the various possibilities there. And then finally, a changing of the guard at the Vatican Secretariat for the Economy, sort of the tip of the spear when it comes to financial reform. We'll explain why this signals a change in personnel, but probably not a change in direction. All of that and more is waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church. So please, stay where you are. We will be right back. Hey, well, hello there again, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, December 6th in the year of our Lord, 2022. Those of you watching, if you have ever been to Rome, chances are quite good that you have probably been to the Vatican. And if you have, chances are, I would say 50-50, that either on your way there or on your way back, you took a Roman street called the Via delle Fornaci. This is one of the main arteries that carries people to and from the Vatican. It starts way up atop the Janiculum Hill, leads all the way down to the road that is immediately opposite the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, kind of the southern tip of St. Peter's Square. Probably 50% of the traffic in Rome that goes in and out of the Vatican every day takes this street. And there's a whole cluster of businesses on the Via della Fornace that depend upon that traffic. Now, the problem is, since late October, a big chunk of the Via delle Fornaci has been shut down, closed, both to automotive traffic and also to pedestrian traffic. This chunk of the road, it's about a mile away from the Vatican, is right next to this large villa, which contains the Russian embassies in Italy, so the embassies to Italy and also the embassy to the Vatican, And it also contains the Russian Orthodox Church of St. Catherine of Alexandria, or St. Catherine the Martyr. Roman authorities have deemed that this massive stone wall that surrounds the estate and kind of faces the Via delle Fornaci, they have deemed it unsafe, in danger of collapse, and have asked the Russians to make repairs. Since late October, the Russians have basically said, yet, not going to do it. We're not interested in ponying up the dough that it would cost to keep this road open. And so in a very literal sense, the Russians have sort of shut down a road that leads to the Vatican. Already one coffee bar in the area has shut down because of a lack of customers. Other restaurants are complaining. We're going to see what happens with that. But in the meantime, this is a metaphor for the state of the broader relationship between the Vatican and Russia these days. As you know, as we've talked about in this show many times, since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, the Vatican, Pope Francis, have done everything they possibly can to try to position themselves as possible mediators, peacemakers, bridge builders in this conflict. The Pope has deliberately avoided 
naming Russian President Vladimir Putin as the aggressor in this conflict, as a bad guy. He has, on more than one occasion, suggested that provocative steps by NATO may have helped contribute to the lead up to this war, suggesting that, that Putin and Russia may have some merit when they talk about the concern that Russia was being encircled by the Western powers, and on and on. And even very recently, the Pope, once again, and his top aides have talked about how they'd like to be able to mediate. However, that possibility seems more distant than ever right now because Pope Francis last week gave an interview to the Jesuit-sponsored America magazine, one of the leading Catholic publications in the United States. He talked about the Ukraine conflict, and in the course of his remarks, he said that many of the most brutal atrocities, moments in this conflict, have not been the result or the fault of Russian forces themselves, but of ethnic minorities allied with the Russians, and he specifically mentioned the Chechens and the Buryats. Now, that bit of rhetoric has produced an enormous, I think, blowback from the Russian side. A spokesperson for the Russian foreign ministry said that it's not only Russophobia, but it's a kind of detachment from reality. The Russian foreign minister himself described it as not Christian language and insulting to the minorities that make up the Russian Federation. Representatives for both the Chechens and the Buryats have also objected quite vociferously. And the net result is that it seems that Russia is less interested now and, and less inclined to see the Vatican and Pope Francis as a fair broker in this conflict than it has been at any point perhaps since the war broke out in February. And so, at the geopolitical and diplomatic level, therefore, Russia also seems to be blocking roads that might lead to the Vatican. You know, we will see where all this leads, but in, at least in the short term, it does not seem particularly likely that this ambition, Pope Francis and his Vatican team, to be the kind of trusted intermediary in resolving this conflict is going to be realized, again, at least in the short term. All right, we shift now to Vatican conspiracy theories. In Italy, there has long been a kind of, well, for lack of a better word, industry that is devoted to the design, the manufacture, the production, and the distribution of these conspiracy theories. The latest entry in this industry is a new book titled Sangue in Vaticano, Blood in the Vatican, which is about the 1998 Swiss Guard murders in which a member of the Swiss Guard killed his commander, his commander's wife, and then killed himself, or at least that is the official version of events. There have been multiple theories over the last quarter century that would attempt to put a kind of different spin on these murders. Some have claimed that these three people were killed as part of a power struggle between the Masons and Opus Dei to see who was going to be calling the shots in the Vatican. Others have claimed that the commander in this story was a former spy for the East German security service, the Stasi, and that somehow that factored into all of this. This new book, Blood in the Vatican, while not taking, while not favoring any of those particular theories, basically suggests that there is a Vatican cover-up going on, that the investigation of these murders was rushed, deeply flawed, so much so that it suggests that there is some unpleasant truth that the Vatican is attempting to conceal. And here's the interesting part. The author of this book is a Roman lawyer by the name of Laura Segro. Now, Segro is also the lawyer for the family of Emanuela Orlandi, that's the 15-year-old Vatican girl 
who disappeared in 1983 and who was the subject of the recent Netflix documentary, Vatican Girl. In fact, Orlandi's brother, Pietro, was on hand for a presentation this past week of Seguro's new book and suggested actually that the disappearance of his sister and the Swiss Guard murders may somehow be connected, not so much in terms of the inner details of the two cases, but simply the fact that, according to Pietro Orlandi, some of the same players, by which he means some of the same, well, bad guys in the Vatican, were involved in both situations. Also on hand, by the way, at the presentation of this book was John Luigi Nuzzi. You may remember him from the Vatty Leaks 2.0 affair. That's when two Italian journalists, Nuzzi and another guy by the name of Emiliano Fittipaldi, acquired a truckload, basically, of confidential documents about Vatican finances and other matters and published them. They, along with several former members of the Vatican Study Commission, were indicted by the Vatican Civil Tribunal. The two journalists were eventually acquitted on the grounds that the Vatican didn't really have jurisdiction over them. Nutzi has kind of made a career out of researching and writing up what he considers to be the deep, dark secrets of the Vatican. His most recent book is titled the Vatican's Little Black Book, 50 Years of Secrets, Misdeeds, and Lies. And, you know, that kind of gives you a sense uh, of the flavor of the thing. The interesting point is that all of those people were together to talk about Segro's new volume. I guess the point here is, if you once decide that the Vatican is trying to pull the wool over your eyes, that it is actively engaged, in a cover-up of some deep, dark secret on one front, then you are probably dispositionally much more likely to believe it on multiple other fronts. And you will kind of come together to support one another. That's what we saw this past week. All right, now, speaking of the Orlandi case, new development on that front. At the same time that, well, at roughly the same time that Orlandi disappeared in 1983. There was another girl who disappeared a couple months later by the name of Marella Gregory, and not a Vatican connection in that case. Her family lived in Rome, ran a bar. And there was a, a boy who was actually killed in a Roman forest, a 12-year-old or Uruguayan boy by the name of Jose Guraman, whose father had been an Uruguayan diplomat in Rome. And he and the young boy's mother had more or less taken refuge in Rome because they were part of the Uruguayan left, the Latin American left, very critical of the police states and military regimes that at that point in history were in power in Latin America. Now, the interesting point is that the mother of Jose Guruman has given an interview this week to Corriere della Sera, which is kind of the paper of record here in Italy, sort of the, the New York Times of Italy, in which she has asserted that her son, killed in that forest in 1983, was actually killed by a guy named Marco Acetti, that he was the guy driving the vehicle that ran down her son. Marco Acetti is a familiar figure for those who have followed the bouncing ball of the Orlandi story. In 2013, Acetti came forward and essentially confessed that he had been part of the, the team that kidnapped Emanuele Orlandi and claimed that he had been the figure who was making phone calls to the Orlandi family essentially providing them with information about Emanuela and also the agenda of the kidnappers, what it was that they wanted. And as proof that he actually was involved in the conspiracy, he presented the family with the flute that Emanuela had been carrying the day she disappeared. The family confirmed that was indeed her flute 
which seemed to lend some credence to Achates' claims. Now, over the course of time, however, the brother, Pietro, who probably knows more about the Alandu case than anybody on Earth, he decided that Achete was basically blowing smoke, that he was not credible, that he was just one of these personality types that likes to inject himself into storylines in order to get attention and feel important. And a psychological profile of Achete reached more or less the same conclusion. However, the mother of Guraman, the young Uruguayan boy, is now claiming that not only was Achete the assassin of her son, but that he was acting on behalf of the infamous Masonic Lodge in Italy, P2. And that, that, in other words, this was part of a Masonic conspiracy to, and that the Masons were acting in league with political forces who supported those right-wing military dictatorships, something called Operation Condor in Latin America in the 1970s and 80s. And, and the mother left open the possibility that that might also have had something to do with the Orlandi disappearance. I mean, it all seems a little tenuous, I suppose, in terms of concrete proof. But nevertheless, it certainly ensures that the Orlandi saga and Marco Achedi's place in it will, will get a new lease on life and will continue to be part of what the Italians call this giallo, this yellow. And the Italians use the term giallo for an unresolved mystery story. Ladies and gentlemen, that's basically what you've got here. Now, on another front, where you've got lots of mystery stories and conspiracy theories over the years that have also floated around, Vatican finances. So, as you know, if you watch this show on a regular basis, the Vatican is currently in the middle of what I have dubbed its trial of the century. This massive civil trial in which 10 defendants, including for the first time a cardinal of the church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, have been accused of various forms of, well, financial high crimes and misdemeanors, embezzlement, graft, overbilling, all kinds of things, basically having their hands caught in the cookie jar. And the star witness for the prosecution is an Italian monsignor by the name of Alberto Perlasca. Perlasca ran the finance office in the Secretary of State when most of the deals, including the $400 million property deal in London that's at the heart of this thing, when those deals were all, were all worked out. His fingerprints are all over it. So at the beginning of all this, many people thought that Prolaska would be one of the first people to be indicted. However, seeing the handwriting on the wall, Prolaska instead went to the prosecution and essentially volunteered to, well, rat out everybody else in the story. That is, turn state's evidence on his former colleagues, both people who worked for him and also his superiors, up to and including Bechu. And Perlaska did that in the form of what the Italians call un verbale, which basically means a, a memo. Wrote a lengthy memo with this new version of his testimony in which, you know, he essentially blames a bunch of other people for what went wrong. Now, when he, when he turned over this memo in 2020, just before the trial began, he asserted that it was entirely his own work. However, during this past week, Prolaska was called to testify during the Vatican trial, and under examination, he actually admitted that although the answers were all his, that the choice of subjects to be covered, that is, the kind of, well, the outline of this memo was given to him by somebody else, a female friend of his. And this female friend had told Prolaska that she had consulted an elderly Italian judge in putting it together. Prolaska then proceeded to admit that later on, when he insisted that his friend tell him the name of this elderly Italian judge, when it became clear he was going to be asked this under examination at the trial, the friend admitted that there was no elderly Italian judge, that instead, she had turned 
to Francesca Immacolata Chalqui. Now, if that name seems familiar to you, it should, because she was the femme fatale of Vatty Leaks 2.0. She was the for, former PR expert for the Italian branch of Ernst & Young, who had been asked by Pope Francis to serve on this study commission to look into Vatican finances. She ended up developing a kind of very close relationship with the Italian Monsignor who was running the commission and a number of other insiders in the Vatican kind of became ubiquitous in the Italian press because, among other things, it was just unusual to see an attractive young lay woman exercising this kind of authority, this kind of prominence in the Vatican. Also, they found some racy pictures of her with her husband online. She was dumbed the, the, sexy, the Vatican sexy bombshell and, and a bunch of other stuff. Then, as this commission sort of fell apart and it became clear that it was leaking like a sieve, Chao Kui was charged along with the Monsignor who ran the, the operation as being one of the, the principal leakers. She was eventually convicted, sentenced to 10 months in prison, or was it eight months? I don't remember. But she was sentenced to a, sort, a short prison term, but that was suspended because during the trial, she actually gave birth to a son whom she named Peter in honor of the Pope. So she is a very familiar figure in terms of Vatican jolly, mystery stories, and conspiracy theories, and she is now back as potentially a protagonist in the trial of the century. Both she and this other friend of Prolaska's are now scheduled to testify themselves before the trial sometime early in the new year. Stay tuned. We will obviously have full coverage. All right, two other brief things. This week, the Vatican was subject to a hack. On Tuesday afternoon around 3 o'clock Rome time, basically all of the Vatican's websites went down. You would get error messages if you tried to get onto them. That lasted until sometime Wednesday morning. Initially, a Vatican spokesperson said, oh no, the sites are just offline for routine maintenance. But as time drug on, he was actually compelled to admit, well, no, they were actually shut down because there were anomalous attempts at access, which is a polite way of saying somebody was trying to hack them, okay? Now, they're now back up and running. But no explanation has been given, despite the fact that the spokesperson said that a technical investigation was underway. No explanation has been given as to who was behind this hack or what their agenda was. Now, the Italian press abhors a vacuum, so they have kind of gone nuts with speculation. The most popular theory in the Italian press is these were the Russians in retribution for the Pope's comments that they didn't like about the Chechens and the Buryats or just in general for the hell of it because Russians do this kind of thing. Others believed it was the Chinese because of a, of a spat, recent spat between the Vatican and China over the appointment of a bishop. Still others believed it was one of these, you know, major international sort of rogue hacker outfits. You know what nobody floated? is the possibility that it was just some 16-year-old kid in his mom's basement having a kick on a Tuesday afternoon and showing he was smarter than the security the Vatican has. Why did no one consider this possibility, at least publicly? I think because the Vatican, when it's the Vatican, it's just a magnet for the most outlandish and colossal conspiracies and plots and Machiavellian maneuvers you can possibly imagine. Our minds, when it's the Vatican, our minds don't go to Occam's razor, that the simplest solution is usually the best. Uh, they go to the, op whatever the opposite of Occam's razor is, that's where we go. And that's what we had this week with the hack. We will see if the Vatican ever chooses to tell us who it actually was and what the actual deal was. All right, finally this week, there has been a change of the guard at the top of the Vatican Secretariat for the Economy. This was one of three new institutions created by Pope Francis at the beginning of his papacy to be the tip of the spear for his financial reform. It is the role of the Secretariat of the Economy 
in effect, to enforce budget discipline on the Vatican and to make sure that there is an adequate paper trail for the money that the Vatican brings in and the money that it spends. Up to this point, it was initially led by Cardinal George Pell. Then, once Pell was forced to step aside because of his illegal difficulties in Australia, the Pope tapped a Spanish Jesuit by the name Father Guerrero to run the Secretariat for the Economy. And that lasted until this past week, when it was announced that Father Guerrero was stepping down for personal reasons. He recently had to have a pretty serious surgery and was being replaced by a Spanish layman by the name of Maximino Caballero Ledo. Now, this is by no means a change in direction at the Secretariat for the Economy. Caballero had been appointed Guerrero's secretary two years ago in 2020, so he had already been the number two official. The two men were childhood friends. They grew up together and by all accounts, basically have the same vision of how things ought to work. The difference is, if I can put it this way, that Guerrero was seen as a bit of a problem child when it came to basic management. He was seen as a bit of a heavy hand as a manager, somebody who quickly became impatient with people and situations, and who, quite honestly, was just a little difficult to be around sometimes. Caballero, on the other hand, has a reputation of being a very nice, sweet guy that most people like. And I think you have to take this move at the Secretariat in tandem with the recent crackdown at Caritas to suggest that Pope Francis is trying to put out some just basic management fires in the Vatican. Our natural tendency will be to read these in terms of ideological, political, philosophical, theological fracases and ferments. Truth of it is, we may just be dealing with some, you know, HR cleanup that's going on. Footnote to the Caballero appointment, he becomes the second layman now put in charge of a Vatican dicastery. He follows Paolo Ruffini, the Italian layman who runs the dicastery for communication. So we have two lay people running Vatican departments, where heretofore was entirely the province of clergy, usually archbishops and cardinals. Substantively, does that make much difference? I don't know. But I can say symbolically, it certainly says something about the efforts to empower laity under the Francis papacy. And it is interesting, of course, that communications and finances are the two places where that has happened first, because those were the areas where Francis began his reform 10 years ago. All right, as ever, you can find full coverage of these stories on the Crux site. That is www.cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. So be with us. Over the course of the next seven days, my charge to you, is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and a blessed week, and we will talk to you very soon.